to go. Um, hey everyone. So uh, welcome to the 176th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, we're still reserving number 174 for the SEF meeting when it's rescheduled. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from Sean O'Connor, um, giving us an intro to Django. Tonight, before we get started, we have four quick requests, the usual four for anyone who's a regular. Those are silence your cell phones, do not use the coffee maker, do not eat snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentation. We'll hear you almost anywhere in here, unfortunately. Sorry about that. And um, when, when time comes for questions, please use the mic. So raise your hand, we'll try to come over, and that way the uh, people at home will be able to hear you. That you should know we are recording this for later, and we also have a hangout on air running, so people will be able to kind of see you, you know, almost in real time. Uh, we'd like to quickly thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. Uh, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. All right, so next item. After the meeting, we encourage everyone to join us for more talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub, which is at 250 West 14th Street. It's on the southeast uh, side of uh, 14th and 8th. It's, uh, for any of you who've been there before, it's very easy to find. Um, we'll have a couple of groups heading over, so when things wrap up here, just grab a group and people will walk you over there. Um, we have the back area reserved and the volume will be lowered when we're there, so it'll be great for talking. You can order foods, drinks, and it'll be a good time if you want to go. We're hoping to have more conversation to, hopefully uh, you can ask questions of Sean or anyone else here. Um, all right, so a few quick announcements. Next month, we will be having our annual holiday party on December 9th. Uh, this year, we'll be doing a multi-group party again. There are, what was that number, 12, 15, 500 groups, 16 groups? All right, 16 uh, different meetup groups who are going to be there, not just us. So uh, last year, the space was kind of tight. This year, we're going to be in suspenders, uh, renting out the space down in the uh, Wall Street area, right? It's going to be tighter. Because the suspenders are going to... Oh, no. oh okay. All right, sorry. Um, Can you talk about the disc yet? Okay. Our next official meeting after that, uh, so the, the meetup page will get updated with all that information in the near future. Uh, sorry, getting some, uh, some notes here. Um, the next official meeting is going to be on January 9th, and it's going to be a meeting about AMD 64-bit ARM server chips. Uh, that'll also be up on the Meetup page in the near future. Our next workshop will be Tuesday, November, uh, yeah, Tuesday, November 19th, and please find Rob Menez, David Bristow, or James Meldrum. I don't see him right now, so uh, Rob or David, if you have any questions about that. Um, the location of our workshops, the Hudson Library, is going to be closing for renovations for a few months in the new year. So if, um, if anyone has any thoughts about spaces where the workshop could be held while those repairs are ongoing, please again find Robert David and let them know of your ideas. We'd like to explore any possibilities. Um, in case you missed it on the way in, there are, uh, there are Linux distro DVDs in the back there. So if you want to try out a different distro or something like that, please go ahead and uh, grab one. And uh, that's it for my announcements. Does anyone else here have anything they would like to announce for a group, personal things, events, anything like that? Okay, nothing. Well, uh, on that note then, uh, Sean O'Connor, intro to Django. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, just quickly, the goal of this talk is to give you a rough idea of kind of why you might want to use Django, what, what it's well suited for and kind of point you in a direction to learn uh, more from there. So not going to do any of the you know blog of five minutes on this. Um, but oh, and I hit the wrong button, of course. So I can do this for a living or anything. Um, so before I get into that, a little bit about oh. uh, I'd say feel free to ask questions during the talk, but I might defer till after if it's going to be a longer answer. Uh, so real quick, uh, who am I and why should I why should you bother listening to me about any of this? Uh, during the day, I'm the lead application engineer at Bitly, um, and I'm more relevant to Django specifically. Uh, I've helped organize Django NYC for about the last five years, 
I've also been a major uh, contributor to DjangoCon for the last few years, which is like the main US DjangoCon. Um, so Django, what is it? Uh, it's a web development application framework. Uh, excuse me, weird use of words. Um, and for a little background on kind of where it came from, to give you some context on it, uh, there were a bunch of guys at this little newspaper slash media company in Kansas called Journal World, um, who were building a new CMS. And uh, they were all Python guys and were kind of tired of everything that was out there. So they started working on creating this new generic thing where um, being uh, a fairly forward-thinking newspaper, they're doing more and more stuff online and had to do more interactive content that they had to kind of iterate on quickly. So a lot of the existing CMSs didn't really work well. Um, a particular interest in this photo, you can see the guy all the way on the left is Simon Wilson. Uh, then uh, the two guys in the middle are Adrian Hallbody and Jake Captain Moss. They're the EDFLs in the project. They're still are pretty involved, and uh, Matt Pride at the end, uh, who's one of the early core contributors. Um, so it kind of started off there, and about it was open. I think they started the work in about 2003, 2004. It's open sourced in 2005, and now it's you know got a pretty substantial global community, uh, people working on it all around the world, and it's used by some of the largest web properties uh, there are: Discuss, Pinterest, Mozilla, Instagram. Uh, they're all we're started on Django and are using it in some fashion. Today. Um, so, uh, getting into the meat of things, when I say web application framework, what does that mean, right? That's kind of fuzzy, right? Um, well, for starting at the kind of the foundation, right, it's a pile of Python code. So I, I imagine most people here have heard of Python, but just everybody heard of it? Yes? Awesome. Cool. Uh, so Python, it's, it's programming language. I love it. It's uh, pretty easy to pick up and, you know, well, so it's just a general purpose language. Um, so Django is just a pile of Python. Um, and you can kind of think of it as a toolbox, right? Um, it, it has a, a series of tools that are generally useful when you're doing things that look like web applications. Uh, another way you can think of it is Legos, right? A bunch of pieces that you're going to snap together um, to create something useful and, and do something that ultimately moves towards your end goal. Um, and generally speaking, your end goal isn't to put up a website, it's to, you know, create an application to do X, Y, Z for, for yourself or for your customers or your group or whatever. Um, so a side effect of that, though, is it's not like a push and play kind of thing, right? It's not like WordPress or something like that where you push a button and you get a website that you can modify to a web, right? Just like a Lego set, uh, when you kind of open the box with Django, you get a bunch of pieces, right? And you have to do a bit of work to put them together um, before you have anything that's useful, right? Um, so why would you want to bother with something like that, right? If I'm not getting something out of the box right away, why, why do I want to deal with that? Um, and the answer a lot of times comes down to not reinventing the wheel, right? To, to do a well-made web application, there's tons of stuff that you just, like, you just have to do to get the job done, but is in no way interesting or relevant to um, what, you're, what you're, the thing you're specifically trying to accomplish, right? Like, Handling HTTP requests is not a novel problem. That's been solved really well. Um, so why reinvent that wheel, right? Taking that a step further, a lot of those problems have been solved by people who are smarter than you and are more experienced than you. Um, so you can gain a lot by taking advantage of the, the solutions that people who've been doing this for a long time have already come up with. Um, to, to kind of build on this, you can kind of think of the different types of solutions there are for things out there and different types of tools as a spectrum, right? At one end of the spectrum, you're building everything from the ground up from scratch, right? This is great in that it gives you a ton of flexibility, right? Since you're building everything from scratch, from the ground up, you can do anything you want, right? And it's going to be made exactly the way you want it to be made, which is great. The problem is it's going to be really expensive and really slow because you're having to solve all these basic problems that or just prerequisites to accomplishing something on the web. To the other end of the spectrum, you have something that works right out of the box, right? Like your brand new smartphone. You can take it out and push a button and it turns on and does everything you want. Um, the drawback there is it's much more rigid, right? What it does coming out of the box is what it's going to do when it does, right? And it's not going to change. There's no easy way that you're going to like, you know, to fundamentally change what it does. Um, Conversely, it's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot faster just because you're you know, just taking something already made, right? 
Um, so Django kind of falls in the middle of that, right? It's a bunch of pre-made pieces that you can put together to build different types of useful things. Um, since those pieces are pre-made and are designed to work together in certain common ways, um, you get a lot of that speed and, and cost savings that you get from using something off the shelf, but you're also gaining a lot of the flexibility of building something from the ground up since you're still controlling how you're putting those together and building a lot of the pieces that connect them together, right? Um, so getting this into somewhat more practical terms, as a side effect of that, what is Django good for? Something it's not great for is just um, publishing content, putting pages up, right? You can do that, but it's kind of like killing a fly with a sledgehammer, right? It's really overkill. Um, if all you want to do is have a nice web UI for managing a few couple pages of content or a blog, there are much better suited tools for that. On the other hand, if you're having an application that really just thinks of the world as data with business logic applied to it, Django is very well suited. Um, that's, that's absolutely what it's designed for from the ground up. Um, and, you know, kind of carrying through with that, uh, it's good to kind of think of uh, or understand some of the philosophies around how Django was built and how it's envisioned to be used. Um, one of the things that comes up a ton in the, the Django community is this quote from Larry Wall, which I suppose is slightly ironic for Python people to be quoting the Perl guy, but anyway. Um, and it's easy things should be easy and hard things should be possible, right? So this means that the, the, the framework should do a lot of, give you a lot of affordances to make really common tasks very simple and, and quick to do. Um, but it shouldn't solve all your problems, right? There's always going to be some problem that's too esoteric, too complex, too domain specific for the framework to solve. But it shouldn't get in your way when you're trying to solve those hard problems. Um, and the other kind of core tenet is it's just Python. Right? There's no crazy magic going on here for the most part. Um, and there's nothing preventing you from pulling in other Python components. A lot of times if you have some domain specific need for something you're doing, uh, like let's say you need to do GOIP lookups, right? Django doesn't have anything built in for that, but there's tons of really solid existing Python libraries and you can just use them, right? You just import them like you would in any other Python program and use them. So. Um, with that, we're going to dive into some of the components that uh, Django gives you out of the box, right? Those tools, those Lego pieces, right? Um, one of the basic ones is the ORM, Object Relational Mapper. Um, the ORM basically gives you kind of two pieces, right? It gives you a standard way to describe the data of your system, right? The state of your system. Uh, and then it gives a bunch of nice management tools for persisting that data into a relational database, hence Object Relational Mapper. Um, so objects in Django look like this. Um, even if you're not a Python coder, you can probably make heads and tails of this, right? I have a class, it's called person. It has two fields called first name and last name. Um, and they're both char character fields with a length of 30, right? Um, so this, by just by creating this basic definition, you get a few things. Uh, first thing that'll happen is you have a bunch of tools to go create a table in a database that where the schema matches this. Um, Additionally, you get a pre-baked API that uh, for doing CRUD operations on these uh, the entries in that table, right? So here I say uh, person to objects to create uh, first name equals Chauncey, last name uh, McPufferson. That's the uh, little fish guy, Bitly, uh, and then it gives you back an object, right? So well, sorry. Once you call that function, it creates an entry in the database. Uh, including a numeric ID for it. And then it comes back and gives you an instance of that class that has all of that data populated. Once you have that instance, you can say chauncey.firstname and that will print out, or uh, chauncey in this case, right? It'll point out the data in the, that field in the database. Um, similarly, you can modify things. So here we're saying, uh, this is actually a poor example because I'm setting it to what it's already set to. But, um, you can set the fields to something and call save, and that'll persist it to the database, right? Um, and lastly, you can say delete, right? And that's just going to, again, clean up what's there. Um, these are all just kind of examples to give you a flavor of how Django looks and plays with. Uh, these are all, or all either adapted from or taken straight out of the Django docs and tutorials, so I wouldn't worry about too much about trying to scroll them down. I'll also post the slides after the talk. Um, so in addition to those basic CRUD operations, uh, you get a bunch of ways to get your data back from the database. 
Um, so here, again, pretty straightforward. You know, if you're not a Python programmer, you import your model and you say, uh, person that objects uh, get ID equals one, right? And then what that will do is give you back the person with the ID of one from the database. Pretty straightforward. Uh, under the covers, what's happening is, you know, based on the parameters you're putting in there, it's coming up with a SQL query, executing that query, getting the row back, and turning the data in that row into your object, right? Um, here, we're going to do something a bit more complicated, right? We're going to say, give me all the persons with a first name of Bob, right? And then give me back a list of Bobs. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. And all this, obviously, like, uh, this is what I was talking about as far as the, that trade off of, um, you know, building something from scratch versus having something pre made, right? Obviously, you could just write the SQL query for you, this, execute it, get the rows back, and turn that into some kind of data structure that you're going to use. But that's not necessarily terribly unique to what you're doing, right? And Django just did that for you. Um, there's some trade-offs, and some people aren't wild about how it goes about doing that. But that's you know a decision to make. Um, and the other thing that tends to be nice, especially as one of the things that were in the early days of Django back in the, to the early 2000s that was a bit rough is you know. It provided these basic features, but there was some point where things broke down, right? Like there was some lower level of access that you wanted that you just couldn't really get. So you had to throw out all the machinery and free bits that you got from Django and had to rewrite it yourself. But as it's mature, excuse me, it's gotten this really nice, elegant path to kind of give you exits and, and hooks as you go down lower level and needing more access. So an example of that is in the ORM, there's this kind of ultimate bailout. Uh, before just going to start making your own queries, is uh, this raw method. So person objects that raw, unless you just write your own SQL query, and then as long as what's coming back looks like the table structure of um, the model being queried, it'll to handle all the, the rehydration of taking those results and turning them back into a, a factory list. Um, so it gives you kind of this nice curve, and there's actually more you can do with the ORM, but it, again, it gives you all these nice hook points to do just as much work you have as much control as you need, and no more, right? And it's, it's kind of nice. Uh, yep? Uh, database is not go. Oh, sorry, yeah. I don't know if we have a... Uh, the, the database... Oh. <laughs> yeah, the, the database you have, uh, is that... Uh, the database you have, is that part of... Python, or is that brought in by Django, or is that uh, so something separate? It's something separate, generally. So uh, Django has a bunch of different database backends, so that the ORM can work with different databases. Oh. The two most commonly used are uh, MySQL and Postgres. Postgres probably being the most commonly used, uh, but it also has some additional backends. So like it has SQLite, so you can have easy use in development just all on one machine, or um, you know, it has some stranger ones like Oracle or. Um, yeah, here. Why did they put an ORM in this? Um, so that's a bit of a historical quirk to a certain degree. Uh, well, there's two sides. I'd say on one side there was a bit of a historical quirk in that 2004-2005 packaging in Python was bordering on useless. Um, if there were other ORMs out there, but one of the goals from, for Jane was that it would be batteries included. Right. You know, so it's one package and you had most of everything you needed to get going. So that led the project down a bit of a different path than uh, something like, uh, what was it, Turbo Gears uh, at the time was a, a somewhat equivalent framework that uh, took a different approach of just gluing together all the different pieces from all these different communities, right? So using SQL Alchemy and Mako and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so at the time, when you had, when you're pulling in like a dozen different packages, the install process for that was just a nightmare, right? It would take you a month, or not a month, but it would take you a week to get up and running each time you started a new project. So having batteries included was nice. Um, some other stuff that then came as side effects from that approach that were nice were that um, now your release cycle is completely synced, right? You know that all the components that are coming out in a given release all work together and are going to have a common API that makes sense. Additionally, all those components you know are going to play nice, right? There's, there's always a bit of a roughness where, in, you know, coordination across projects can be really tough. So by having all this stuff live under one umbrella, it's it's useful, right? Um, so and you know, a side effect of since this isn't the only thing the Django project does, the Django ORM is a reasonable ORM, but it's not like the like there's a lot of SQL often you can do that Django can't, do, 
right? Um, so, um, but Django is competent for a lot of, you know, a lot of use cases, right? Um, so it's trade-offs, right? Um, and again, it comes back to it's just Python. So if you really want to use SQL Alchemy, you can use SQL Alchemy. Uh, you lose some of the existing integrations just by the nature of it being an external project, but for the most part, you can just use it. Uh, we have another quick question, then we'll go. Open. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so the question was, would I recommend using Mongo? Um, so the deal there is Django's ORM is meant as an object relational mapper. There have been some efforts to use non-relational databases with it, but at the end of the day, you get into this really awkward place where since the ORM was designed around the, op the relational model, using other models gets really hairy really fast. So generally speaking, the way people deal with uh, non-relational databases within Django is to just use uh, the libraries for those databases directly, right? So basically you bypass the, the ORM system. Again, just like using SQL Alchemy, you usually lose some of the integration stuff that's out there, but there's still a lot that you get out of it. And in a lot of cases for the more popular databases like Mongo, there are a lot of third-party packages that provide alternate integrations to a lot of the other Django tools that are out there. Cool. So kind of moving along here, uh, you have routes, right? So you have an application, you have URLs, and eventually you have to map that to doing something, right? So this is how Django goes about doing that. Um, it's pretty straightforward, you have this uh, URL object, right? Um, you basically give it a regular expression to say what the path that you want to match is. Uh, you give it a call, yeah, sorry, this, this is a little small. You give it any kind of uh, Python call, right? So it can be a function, it can be a class, it can be anything that can be called. Um, and optionally, you give it a name. We'll get to why that name is useful in a little bit. Um, additionally, you can grab parameters from the URL by doing uh, named groups within the regular expressions. Um, show how that kind of manifests in a little bit. And yeah, you can just do pretty much anything you're going to do within a, a URL path, you can express that this pretty straightforwardly. Uh, regular expressions, you have to pick up a little brain damage to understand them, but once you do, they're pretty good. Um, you can additionally include other URL files. Um, something that you know, uh, can happen in you, when you get bigger applications is you end up with like a URLs file with like hundreds and hundreds of paths, and that's just crazy, both to manage and just from a performance standpoint. So by being able to include, you can kind of group URLs into sets that make sense and just include them by chunks of paths. So here, um, everything under slash special then goes over to this other URLs file and will try and match everything after the slash special part of the path with that one. It's kind of nice, pretty easy to use. Um, additionally, these URLs are reversible, right? So I can say now, uh, so this first one was, or sorry, uh, this guy, right? I called it detail. So now here, I'm going to say, give me the reverse of the URL called detail, and I'm going to give it a keyword argument of poll of ID. So that's going to stick it in where that named regular expression group was, and just give me the URL back. And this is nice now in that you can just treat URLs as like um, uh, basically interface, right? Like it's just, it, it's effectively cosmetic, right? And that if I change what the path to something is, I don't have to go and find all the links that point to that as long as I'm consistently doing this and there's a helper in the template language as well. Um, it'll just automatically update in all the same places, which would be pretty nice. Um, so something else I've mentioned is views. Another kind of common part of the web framework, right? This is how you're deciding when I get a request, what do I do with it, and how do I respond, right? So views, in, like I said, in Django, can basically be any kind of callable in Python. Uh, the most common kind you'll see are probably just functions. So this is an example of a simple view, right? Uh, we're going to get in request object. You always get past the request object in your view. And this just is an object representation of the HTTP request that's been made to your server. Um, you then do a database query to give the latest polls. Uh, I'm going to put that into a dictionary, and then I'm going to pass that into my template, render it, and give it a response. Uh, if you want, there's basically there's a few helper methods that are being used here, like that render method. Uh, there, right? Um, so these are just convenience things, right? But under the covers, there's still like a, an HTTP response object that's expecting a string, right? And if you want to, like let's say you're returning something that isn't HTML that doesn't make sense to be a template, like let's say JSON, 
you can still get, you, you can very easily get access to those lower levels of components and use them as, as you see fit. Uh, but you don't need to bother with it when you're just, you know, taking this data and rendering the template, right? That's what you want to do a lot of times. So it's easy. Um, when you have those name parameters in the URLs, you get these, um, uh, basically, I guess, passes an argument into your uh, view. So again, here we have, we're capturing poll ID from the path. And it's very easy to now just use that, look it up, and then return things. Here's another kind of neat helper of get object or 404. Pretty much does what it sounds like. It looks up the object in the database. If it can't find it, returns a not found error. Very nice. And again, just a whole lot of, like, that could easily just be five lines of code that you have to write in every single view. But now that's just a function that's done, it's tested, it's proven, and it's very readable. Right? So it's nice. Um, additionally, Django has relatively new, I guess it's about two or three years now, uh, class-based views uh, and generic class-based views. So there's certain things that you just tend to do a whole lot in web applications. So in this case, list view, right? Just, you know, give me the last five things in the database for this model, right? That's just something you do a lot. Um, so this view is effectively the same thing as this view. It's just a bit smaller. Um, there's a bunch of different methods and whatnot in this list view class that you can override and give you hooks into different parts of the response handling process. Um, the class-based views are a bit controversial in the community in that they can be very useful for writing very uh, dry code, right? Don't repeat yourself. But they tend to have, they, they do have a bit of a class hierarchy nightmare. Um, so following through where exactly something is happening can be a bit rough. Um, so they're there. Use them carefully, but try not to overuse them. Um, templates, again, really common part of a web framework. Uh, this is how you go about rendering HTML or other strings. Just strictly speaking, Django templates have default assumptions that lend themselves to HTML, but they can be used for rendering pretty much any kind of string. Um, so here's like a pretty straightforward example of a template where I want to say, here's a poll question, and here's a bunch of the choices that you can select. Um, Again, pretty straightforward, readable, even if you don't know the exact syntax. I'm not going to get too deep into the syntax of it, but uh, it, this is all well, super well documented, so you can go read the details of that. Um, one of the things that actually is nice here is uh, just, at least for me, visually, having the curly braces instead of like angle brackets all over the place, like a Mako or, or ERB or something like that. It just, for me, this is a way easier to read, but it's nice. And like I mentioned, any of these components that I'm pulling up, if you want to, you can swap them out for something else just by importing different libraries and calling. Obviously, the baked-in helper methods won't do that for you, but you can write your own helper methods pretty straightforward. Um, so if you wanted to use Mako or Jinja or something like that, it's not that hard. Uh, forms. Uh, this is one of the things I love in Django. For me, writing uh, validation and error handling code is some of the most boring stuff on the planet. I just if I have to do it all day long, I go nuts, right? So forms give you a ton of that for free. Um, so again, just like models, you have this kind of declarative syntax. I say contact form and define my fields, right? A subject, a message, sender, and CC myself. Um, they each have types that make sense for their own that translate both into uh, HTML form types as well as a chunk of validation logic. So example here would be the email field on that third line. Um, that still just gets rendered as an HTML text field, but it has extra validation to make sure that um, what's entered is a valid email address. Um, so the way you end up using that in the template is just this form SP. It has a bunch of different render methods for how you want to structure the form. There's also a third party libraries to give you more control over that. Um, and it renders something like this. Pretty much what you expect. Um, another nice side effect of this is this is way easier to read than this, right? <laughs> Um, again, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, something else that's nice that is uh, when this page gets re-rendered, like let's say somebody puts in an invalid email address, the form will automatically basically detect that and will just render out like an error field in here on that email field and pre-populate all the existing data. So all that stuff is handled for you, so you don't have to rewrite that every time you write a form. Um, this is an example of what it looks like using a form inside of a view. Um, Again, pretty straightforward, right? Here you're just saying, uh, is the request that method a post, right? Because we don't want to do system modifications on anything but post. Um, if so, get the form, put the post data into the form. Say, is the form valid? If so, awesome, redirect it to the place where we want to go. If not, um, we'll just 
render out the page with the form, again, giving the user the error message back. On the outside of the else, if it's not a post, render the form. Pretty straightforward. And again, it, this is way less code than if you ever had to like actually validate every single one of those fields in each place. Additionally, this is really re nice to make things reusable. Let's say I want to use this form on five different pages. All that validation logic is tied to the form and not the page. So I, I can just carry that around with me wherever I'm going to go. Uh, Django has an interesting uh, auto-generated admin that you can turn on. Um, this is really nice when you're in development uh, or for certain light administrative cases. Um, it basically gives you CRUD access to all, everything in your database. Um, there's a fair degree of customization that you can do here. Um, that being said, it's usually best as long as you <coughs> this way. The admin's really designed for trusted users uh, to have access to everything in basically like here's in the, the form of uh, here's a data type, here's everything of the data type, here's the details for an object. That's what you want. Great. If you try and get it to do other things, you're probably going to be in for pain, and you should probably just build it yourself. Um, but it's still a nice tool to have. It comes out of the box. Um, Django also has a bunch of nice security features uh, that really help you start from a good place with your web application. Uh, in particular, it has a framework for dealing with cross-site request forgery. Right, so you can put secret tokens in your forms, and it'll validate that those come through as expected to prevent people from like creating a fake HTML page on another domain and submitting data to your site causing users to do things that they didn't actually need to do. Um, all, by default, all variables that you output in the templates are escaped for HTML content, preventing most cross-site cross -site scripting vulnerabilities. Um, there's ways to bail out of that if you want, like you're not seriously I validated this is safe and I just want to render what's here. You can do that, but the default is to be safe, right? It's much better to be in a place where if you mess up, somebody sees a funny string instead of if you mess up, you have a security vulnerability. Um, Similarly, the ORM, as long as you don't go pretty far out of your way to circumvent it, will protect you against SQL injection attacks. It handles all the proper escaping and handling of that. Um, has a framework for doing signed cookies. Uh, so a lot of times, uh, it can be useful to keep user session data in cookies, so you don't have to persist that to a database someplace. It can help you scale a lot. Uh, but then you have to worry about users modifying that. Um, so by having cryptographically signed cookies, you can assert that somebody hasn't modified the cookie on the client side. Um, which would be nice. Uh, additionally, it, uh, as we'll get to, Django provides an authentication framework, and if you use that, it pro uh, does proper uh, password hashing using, uh, was it PBFKS2 or whatever that crazy acronym is, as well as uh, bcrypt. And you can kind of choose and plug different uh, hashing algorithms, um, and that saves you from being in the position of, uh, I think it was Adobe this week of having your password database stolen, right? These are algorithms specifically designed to make it really hard for that. Uh, even some, I guess, your database. So there's a bunch of these tools that are really nice to have. Um, again, you can implement all these yourself, but security especially, it's one of those things where like, you really want to be using somebody else's security tools that have been proven and vetted, right? All of Django's security tools have been used in the wild for an extended period of time and have been vetted by security researchers. Something you write yourself probably isn't, and especially the crypto stuff, you're almost certainly going to get it wrong. That's something you want to do. Uh, Django gives you a bunch of testing tools built on top of the native Python testing framework. Uh, one of the nicer things, they have this thing called transaction test case, where it automatically wraps all each test case in your test suite in a transaction and just rolls back the transaction at the end of the test, which allows you to have modify database state inside your test and then have that automatically cleaned up in a really fast way so your tests are fast but actually validating that all your database stuff works as expected. Um, it would be pretty nice to have as much other testing features like a fake client for making requests that use and stuff like that. Um, has a bunch of internationalization tools. I haven't done that whole lot of that myself personally, but I've heard they're nice. Uh, there's an authentication framework, um, so you don't have to bother creating yet another user and login page. The logout page is basically built in views to handle the login, sign up, and log out, as well as both a default model you can use for the user accounts, or you can plug in your own user models. It also has the password caching stuff that I mentioned before. Uh, caching, it has tools for doing caching at a whole bunch of layers. Uh, so you can do caching at a page level, uh, template fragment level, and just straight data, like normal memcache caching, 
Um, it's very nice. There's also some plugins for playing nice with varnish or something like that. Um, logging, normal Python log. So this is, again, built on top of the standard Python logger. Uh, normally, the Python logger can be a bit, let's say, confusing to configure, especially for people in the Python world that just doesn't behave like a lot of the Python things. Uh, so Django basically has a wrapper and some same defaults there that make it a lot easier to work with. Um, email setting. It has, uh, again, a wrapper around the Python uh, email setting APIs <coughs> to, A, make it easier to do stuff like multi-part emails and attachments, but also makes it, they have pluggable backends. So if you want to do something other than uh, SMTP to send messages like uh, the SendMail API or uh, was it whatever Amazon services, you just plug in a different backend and it works. It's very nice. Uh, framework for building RSS feeds, uh, messaging, like, you know, those, like, uh, you submit a form and you go to some page and there's like a little box at the top saying, hey, your form succeeded or you know, you messed up, go back or something like that. It's like a nice little tool for doing that really easily. Uh, sitemaps, uh, same where at Google, if you care about SEO, you know you need these. Uh, this is a nice framework for handling that. Uh, and there's a static file handling pipeline for doing stuff like, <coughs> excuse me, concatenating and minifying and compressing uh, JavaScript files. CSS, and then there's third-party libraries that plug into this that will handle, excuse me, uploading to a CDN or running through more advanced minification processes, or something like that. It's pretty nice. Uh, so that's kind of a quick, the end of a quick tour. And uh, to wrap up, I want to talk about just a few resources for learning Django on your own uh, or getting involved in the community. Uh, the main place to start is DjangoProject.com. This is the official community website. Um, <coughs> Django has easily the best documentation I've seen for any open source project, period. Um, it's fantastic in that it has both good reference documentation, but it also has a lot of prose documentation explaining the why and the how behind things. Um, and they're very consistent about making sure they have good coverage of their documentation. Uh, Pound Django, uh, channel on Freenode. There's always a few hundred people in there, and there are at least a few of them who are willing to answer your questions. Uh, so it's a good place to get some kind of real-time support. So many Django users on Google Groups is kind of the default mailing list for the community. Um, it can be a bit high volume, so I don't know how much you want to subscribe to it, but posting questions on there is pretty helpful usually. Um, as far as events, uh, there's a Django user group in New York that I used to help organize and mostly hand it off to other people, so I can't tell you when the next event is. There should be something in the next month or so. Uh, you can check out DjangoNYC.org, uh, sign up there and see what's going on. Additionally, PyCon is coming up in April. Uh, it's going to be in Montreal this year. And there's usually a pretty good contingent of both Django community folks and Django content, uh, in addition to a bunch of Python content. Uh, PyCon's always a good time, so it's really recommend going. Uh, as far as books type things, uh, there's a site called Getting Started with Django. Uh, this is like a series of like webcasts uh, created by, I think, Kenneth, Kenneth Love um, that are pretty solid for Going a bit deeper than the tutorial on the official Django community site, there's a book called Two Scoops of Django, which is uh, written by uh, Daddy Greenfield and Audrey Roy. Um, it's pretty good. Um, it's technically for the last version of Django. I don't think they've updated for the latest release, but generally speaking, the, the stuff that happens in releases are incremental improvements. You still get you know, the guts right. Um, and a last plug in that realm, I would say, is um, as I've mentioned a few times, Django at the end of the day is just Python. So the better you understand Python, the better you understand Django, and the better you feel you'll be able to use it. And the best book I've seen for learning Python is called Learn Python the Hard Way from Zed Shaw. Um, there's basically a free online edition, and then if you want a print edition, or I think maybe certain ebook formats, uh, you pay for it. But it's absolutely one of the best books I've seen for learning Python. And uh, last place to plug is Django Packages. In addition to all the stuff that Django gives you, there's a pretty thriving ecosystem of third-party packages and libraries and tools either built on top of Django or built for using with Django. Uh, so Django Packages is a pretty good index of what, what tools are out there, how heavily they're used, and kind of like feature comparisons of what's there so you can quickly figure out what, what's the right option to use for what you're trying to solve. Um, and that's about it. Um, before I go to questions, we'll just give a quick shameless plug. Uh, Bitly, we're hiring. Particularly, we're looking for backend engineers and DevOps folks, so let me know about that. We'd absolutely love to talk to you. And uh, with that, we got questions. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but if anybody has a question, raise your hand and we'll uh, send a mic over to you.
in terms of uh, compatibility with Python uh, mm -hmm. versus 3, yep. uh, how much of Django is actually compatible with Python 3? So as of, I think this latest release, there is full support for Django, for, for Python 3. Uh, the, last, the previous release, I think, was a like uh, beta uh, support for Python 3, and the current release is complete Python 3 compatibility. There might be some database backends, I think, that are not Python 3 compatible, but I think all the ones that ship with Django are Python 3. And I think that's mostly dependencies on the underlying libraries that they use. So, you. In terms of authentication uh, and authorization, uh, does it support OAuth 2? Uh, Django out of the box does not provide an OAuth 2 implementation, but there are a number of third party implementations that you can use both as a client and a provider. So I'm uh, I'm really impressed with the customizability of the admin interface. Mm -hmm. I read what you said before that um, it's really for trusted users. You might want to roll that out on a larger scale, but can you elaborate on that a little bit and why it might be a problem? Or is it just a few customizations that are from doing that? Uh, so there's a few facets to that. Um, one of them comes down to, while there are some tools for limiting access for specific users, like let's say a certain user should only have access to certain tables or certain rows, there are some tools for doing that. It's still not great. Um, additionally, the, the two other sides of that are um, a lot of times when you have less privileged users, you really want to have specific workflows for how they manipulate data. It's usually hard for them to understand things at like a table row table row level. So that's a bit of a mismatch. Uh, in the last places, there's not necessarily a whole lot of you'd have to do a lot of work to put really robust validation logic in place. There's a lot of times in an application where if you know certain database values are changed, you could effectively break either a site or functionality for a specific user. So unless you put in a lot of work to do that validation stuff on the admin side. Uh, you potentially appear to have a user breaking things. Um, so that's that's a lot of what that comes down to. It's just you, you can make it work, it's just not what it was really designed for. It was really designed for like, okay, something's weird here, let me go see what's on the database and, and change it and have a easier interface uh, I guess oh, we lose like, just Yeah, uh, what was the biggest problem you had at Bitly that this helped you solve? Uh, so Bitly actually is not a terribly big Django user. We technically do have a little bit of it there. Um, I can speak more for, uh, so before I joined Bitly, I did a mix of consulting work and a startup of my own. Um, in the consulting work, a lot of what we did was basically building customized CMSs with uh, very business specific workflows. And for that, Django was fantastic, right? Because all the stuff I showed you is really great for, for like, basically building CMSs, where right? that's what originally was designed for. Um, so it allowed us to do that work very very quickly, very efficiently, very reliably. Um, and then on the startup side, it was a lot of what I was talking about before, of it allowed me to not spend time solving solve problems again, and just solving the, the stuff that was interesting and novel to our business, right? Because especially, we're doing a, a bootstrap startup, right? And like, literally every minute that you have there is coming out of your pocket. So you don't want to spend on doing stuff that you don't have to do. So that's the thing. Uh, what's the biggest alternative to Django going? What are the differences? Uh, I think it really depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, as far as um, web application frameworks, um, for you know the web ecosystem overall, I'd say Rails is probably the most direct comparison. Uh, so Rails written in Ruby, but um, accordingly it has a lot of the same, much like comparing Python to Ruby, comparing Rails and, and Django, it has a lot of kind of similar similarities and differences at an architectural level. They are virtually identical, but as you get down to the details, the, the different values of the different communities and different priorities of the different communities manifest themselves in some way. Uh, so certain things are maybe less magical and a little bit more <laughs> verbose in Django, but there's other stuff that just works a bit easier in Rails. Um, so you just have those different trade-offs that are reflections of the different communities on it. Uh, 
Um, within the Python world, uh, I guess probably one of the bigger competing frameworks would be, uh, I guess, Pyramid now. Uh, I think that was like a merge of uh, Phone and Turbo Gears a few years ago. Um, that has much more of that approach of like taking together the best of all the purpose-specific packages and tying them together better. Um, but it's out there. Uh, there's also micro frameworks that, um, in some cases, make a lot of sense. Like uh, they mostly use Tornado, um, just because we've already like we already built authentication. We already built all these other things as independent services. So a lot of what you get out of the box of Django just isn't um, useful for us. Um, there's others like Bottle and uh, I'm forgetting another one, Flask. Um, same. Cool. Any other questions? I guess just coming off my route. I don't know what time frame we're talking about. What are some of the major improvements with 1.6 from 1.5? That's something I should have studied a little bit better. Uh, as I said, at Bitly, we uh, don't use a whole lot of Django, so I'm not 100% up to date on things. Uh, if I recall right, uh, I think some of the bigger things has been um, rolling in of schema migration support. I think that was in this release, not the previous one. Uh, so previously, uh, supporting schema migration, so like just making changes to your database, was entirely a third party thing. There was nothing built into Django for it. Um, there's now uh, at least basically ORM level like primitives for doing schema migrations in Django, and I don't remember this release if they got in the higher level like so. The most predominantly used library for this is called South. Um, so I don't remember if they also had like something at a South level of like to actually define the migrations, or if that's going to be in the next release. But there's roadmap for that. That's probably one of the bigger things. Um, I think they made some cleanup and updates to the pluggable user models, and I don't know what else. No, oh, and maturing the uh, Python tree support. I think this 1.6, I think, is the first one that has full, like, official production ready Python tree support. Any following on the, the Rails thing, I'll just throw out just a number of various topics from different ones you want, uh, but I'll mention things that are in Rails and give the corresponding. So, uh, sure. fixtures for or database of everybody's plays, mm -hmm. uh, support for uh, the support of behavior driven work, or if you've ever seen Cucumber, where, yep. where, you, where, you, where you have a grid like thing, which is a test frame for, for, for end, end users yep. to be able to do. Um, well, quickly, I can oh, oh, so the, the, last, the last thing was I noticed sure. that the template system mm -hmm. seems to uh, the for loop that isn't a uh, Python right. construct. Okay. Uh, and so so then why they why not use the Python for loop? Sure. Um, so uh, I think yell at me if I miss any of these. Fishers, Django has built in support for fishers. Um, it's part of the testing tools. Um, there's additionally command line tools for loading manually if you want to use them for data sharing. Um, there's they can be a little finicky to work with, so there's some third party libraries that make it easier to generate and manage them. Uh, but there is built in support for them. Uh, there's also a few different built in serialization formats as far as like JSON, YAML, and maybe something else. Um, as far as BDD, uh, there's nothing built into Django. Uh, there are various integration libraries for stuff like Cucumber. Um, yeah, and I know, uh, I think Gibbet does a lot of that. Uh, so if you look at the Yipit GitHub page, open source page, they have a bunch of info there. I think their blog also has some pretty good info on that. Um, it's one of those things that just, I guess, in the Python community, it's just a much less common practice. So it's just not uh, as commonly asked for. Um, and sorry, what's the last one? <laughs> uh, actually, actually, I thought of two others. Sure. But, but, but uh, the last one I mentioned was the why not use Python syntax? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the Django templates have an opinion that templates should have very little logic. Um, not quite the mustache level of no logic, but very little. Accordingly, it doesn't have, like, it's not just like bracket, insert Python here, bracket. It's actually, like, it's a specific language. Perhaps that's because there was the newspaper people initially? Uh, a little bit. 
bit maybe, but I think it's more just as a, a web framework developer, like if you're putting logic in your templates, like that's, it, it's a poor separation of concerns. Okay. So, so the, the two other things are, uh, one, one of the really cool things of Rail, of, you know, Rail when you're in development mode, you can change a template or you can change code. Mm -hmm. uh, the system notices that the timestamp on the file is changed and it just blows and that makes it yep. more... Jingo has a uh, development server that you can run that on it, it picks up changes and reloads on that. Okay. And then, and then that does, you, you had mentioned rolling back in the commits, but they have this whole thing where they actually clone the development data, the database, and the test database. Yep. Uh, so, oh, that, here we go. Um, so I did kind of gloss over some of the testing stuff. Uh, usually, actually, the, the database, when you run the test runner, it's basically, it creates a second database. It, you can configure it to be differently, but by default, it creates a second database of like test underscore database name, and that's where everything's actually done. Uh, the rolling back that commits is more to provide um, isolation between tests, so that state of one test doesn't affect the state of another test. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what's your experience been in upgrading between versions of Django for applications you've done? Uh, overall, pretty good. Um, if nothing else, so there's, uh, I guess, a few things worth mentioning there. One is if there ever is a backwards uh, breaking change, uh, that's extremely well documented. Any kind of, any kind of even remote change that has a remote chance of affecting things, even certain undocumented but widely used APIs. Uh, that's going to be very clearly communicated from the project. Uh, there's also um, a pretty strong, basically, backwards compatibility and deprecation policy in that um, if something's going to be a backwards breaking change, there has to be a way to support both flavors, like the new version and the old version, for two releases. Uh, so you have a period of time where you're always going to be able to do a gradual change. There's never going to be a period where uh, your code that works on the last release just flat out doesn't work on the next release until it's like the new version's been there for a while. Um, and usually Django releases happen every, I think the goal is every nine months and practice is about once a year. Uh, so generally speaking, they'll have about two years to deal with any kind of rate change. Um, they take the, that backwards compatibility guarantee. I've seen in the, the on Django users mm -hmm. uh, that uh, some people are having trouble going from one version to another. Mm -hmm. Does Django really require you to like sort of remove everything before in, installing a new version? Uh, I guess it. Can you be a bit more specific about the particular? Oh, the, the, I've seen some issues where people were going from 1.5 to 1.6. Uh -huh. And they start talking about problems with, in this particular case, views. Okay. And um, so, in that case, what I suspect happened is um, as much as you may document and try and communicate to people, people don't always pay attention to the notes saying, like, hey, the next version this is going away, or hey, two versions this is going away, and the next version this is going away, hey, this is gone. Um, my guess is people getting caught by that. Um, like, as it might shock some of you, not everybody reads the docs. <laughs> um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, over uh, like anything, over time there will be work you need to do to stay current, but there's always going to be a path forward. There's never going to be a place where it just, it flat out breaks and there's no option to go forward other than like just rewriting your stuff. Um, well, I take that back. You're going to have a time where you can do a gradual transition. You're never going to have to just like flat out everything's broken in your screen. Any more questions? All right, so we have um, we have a bit of a hiccup this week, uh, this month, I should say. Normally, we would have uh, physical books here and some ebook vouchers. What's happened is those have been lost somewhere in the transit system, we think. So what we're going to do is um, we asked Sean to prepare six questions. We'll, we'll definitely get prizes for three, but we're going to need to collect your email address so we can send the voucher to you a little later. Um, we can go for six for just pride of knowledge or whatever. Um, so uh, with that, we're going to do the uh, the end of the presentation quiz. Uh, please, everyone, when the question is asked, when you have the answer, raise your hand. I will we will try to call on the first person who raises their hand, but I don't have enough eyes for that. So we're going to please we're trying to be fair. But don't shout your answer out. We'll bring the mic. 
uh, and whoever has the mic and answers will get uh, either the ebook voucher or the prime. All right? Cool. Sound good? Sure. Uh, so uh, I guess the first question I had was, uh, who was the uh, easy thing should be easy quote from? Uh, I saw you first. David Wong. Oh, close. Close. close to no. <laughs> I think you responded first. I was looking that way, though. Larry Wong, yes, that's right. Would you like Pride or an ebook voucher? Why? Well, to think about it. All right. You want the voucher? But right, we'll get your email address afterwards, okay? Cool. Um, so, what type of use is Django Overkill for? Uh, we. Jeez, I saw your hand first. I'm sorry. I, didn't, I saw you right after. Uh, a simple uh, website that's maybe serving a few docs and uh, uh, just a really simple thing like that. Uh, sure. Sounds good. Pride or ebook? Ebook. All right. So that's two. I'll uh, we'll get your email address afterwards. Uh, what was the name of one of the Django BDFLs? Any of them? It's two. All right, pull out your devices. <laughs> uh, benevolent no dictator for life. It's the leaders of the project. How about we yes. pass on this one? Yep, we can pass on this one. We got some extras, apparently. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else do I got? Uh, here, we'll throw out an easy one. What language is Django written in? So you're in first. Python. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Come on. Uh, right, this is a bit of a hard one. I'll actually be impressed if anybody was paying enough attention for this. What was the name of the uh, Bitly mascot that was used in one of the examples? Show it over there. Let me give you the mic. You say it yourself. Uh, Chauncey McPuffinson. You got it. Yeah. Wow. Pride. Really paying attention. All right, that's the third ebook. We have one more question. I think we'll get your email address in a second. Actually, if you guys um, on the way out, we'll try to grab the three of you. Um, do you want to ask the last question? Sure. Um, I guess it was a bit of an inverse of one I already asked, but just throw it out there. Uh, what type of use case is Django well suited for? Large scale app with a lot of business logic. Well, stop. <laughs> All right, well, you have the prime. Yeah. Sorry, we're out of we're out of other things for today. So, um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to be wrapping this up. Um, uh, everyone the bar uh, we're going to try to get this place back to our host that we cleaned up. So, if everyone just wants to gather together, we'll be heading out um, towards the bar again. It's 250 West 14th Street, McKenna's.